Everybody see that? Okay, awesome. Technology is great when it works. When it doesn't work, you're kind of, oh no, you know? So thanks to Josh Hosh for getting me oriented a little bit this week to uh, try to use my phone to advance a PowerPoint, right? Such important things. Um, so it's, it's uh, so great to, to have a chance to, to teach this morning and to share with you. And uh, I want to honor uh, Pastor Greg, first of all, for the great message that he gave last week about the power of the testimony, right? Amen. And I also want to um, highlight for you that Pastor Aaron will be back next Sunday for Easter Sunday, which is if, if, there's, if there's a Sunday of the year, you know, that, that you, you really need to put your whole life into, that would be it, right? I mean, because that's Resurrection Sunday. And if we can't give our all on Resurrection Sunday, we're not spiritual, we're dead, okay? Because it's, it's, it's also one of the easiest Sundays of the year to invite people to come to church. You know, we, we know from statistics that people come uh, most on Christmas and on Easter, right? And so, you know, if you have some relatives or friends um, and, and God lays it on your heart to invite them to come, please do so because this will be a, a great opportunity to, uh, and, and a sort of a segue or a justification, you know, to invite them to come to this motley crew that we call the upper room, right? Amen, amen. Well, um, I'm excited today to share with you about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In fact, um, um, our, there we go, uh, our, um, um, our, our Lydia as well as uh, Nicole have already shared portions of the scripture that, that I'm going to talk about today. So this is like the third time that you're going to hear the scripture. But I think three is a pretty good number, don't you? My wife is all about numbers, right? And she and three, three, three days, right? Trinity, I could go on. She could go farther, believe me. But but three is a good number. So this will be the third time. So today we remember and we celebrate Jesus triumphal entry into Jerusalem for the last time prior to his crucifixion and his resurrection. Now, most often we call this Sunday Palm Sunday because in John chapter 12, verse 13, John told us that some people grabbed palm branches from the trees and they began to wave and celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. They were waving and, and, and yelling loudly as as Lydia talked about earlier. However, we also know at the same time that Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem was polarizing. In fact, it was as polarizing as the prior three years of his ministry had been. His disciples were there shouting to their loudest voice that the king was coming. The king who was coming in the name of the Lord was bringing a heavenly peace and literally the glory of God into Jerusalem. But the Jewish leaders rejected Jesus because they did not see who he really was. In the moments remaining this morning, we're going to take a dive and, and, and examine Luke's passage about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And it's my prayer that as we consider God's word, that the Holy Spirit will move among us and open our own eyes today and our hearts this week at the beginning of Holy Week so that we can see Jesus more clearly. So turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44. Our story begins with verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, you shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away 
and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near the city, and drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Let's begin with verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went ahead going up to Jerusalem. Now, this is a map that shows Jesus travels from northern Israel in the region of Galilee, up here, which is where Jesus had spent most of his adult ministry for the last three years prior to this time. He was raised in this city called Nazareth, which is located right there. And he did most of his adult ministry around the Sea of Galilee, which is up here, and and out of the city of Capernaum. But the time came in Luke chapter 9 where he turned his face resolutely toward Jerusalem. And for the next 10 chapters of Luke, Jesus is literally traveling from northern Israel all the way down, as this red line shows, into Samaria where he's rejected. He then crosses over the the Jordan River and takes a path all the way down the east side of the Jordan River until he gets to this point. And it's believed then he crosses over through Jericho and then into Jerusalem for the last time. Now, this takes place over 10 chapters of the book of Luke. And during that time, on the way, Jesus is training his disciples. He's training them literally how to minister as he ministered. They're walking with him. They're seeing him heal people. They're seeing him raise the dead. They're experiencing day-to-day life with him. They are burning and imprinting on their minds memories that they will carry with them the rest of their life. It's during this time that Jesus will tell them, not once, not twice, but three times, there's that number, three times that he's going to Jerusalem. That when he gets there, he will be arrested. He will be beat He will be crucified, and then he will rise on the third day. He has told them this three times already, but we're going to find out that they still don't understand the significance of that. They believe he's the Messiah. They believe he's the one who is to come in the lineage of David and restore the kingdom of David to Israel. They believe all of that. They've seen the miracles to know that. But they haven't pieced it all together in their mind to understand that the kingdom that he was to bring was not going to be an earthly kingdom set up through military battle. 
but a spiritual kingdom that would not only bless Israel, but the entire earth. So it's hard for us, I think, it's truly hard for us to understand how climactic this moment really is. When Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, you see the whole of the Old Testament pointed to this event, to this time when the king would come to Jerusalem. We go all the way back to Genesis from the fall of man, where we became separated from, from God, put out of the garden because of our own sin. God then chooses a man called Abraham, who's going to father a nation of people that will essentially be the, the steward through which he will ultimately send the Son of God to come, to be the sacrifice for us all. And so Abraham is, is chosen and to father a great nation. The, the Israelites go into bondage. God sends Moses to redeem them from the bondage of Egypt to set them free, to bring them into the promised land. Again, showing that God redeems his people. The prophets come as Israel strays from, from the God who, who Moses gave them the Ten Commandments and said, this is, this is the character of God. This is how God would have you to live in relationship with him. But they strayed, worshiping idols, the Baals, etc. They strayed. The prophets come and they say, you must turn, you must repent, you must come back to God. And they kill the prophets. They kill the prophets. And now ultimately, after 2,000 years of history, the Son of God comes riding into Jerusalem. God himself, God in Abad, comes riding into Jerusalem. He knows what he's going to do. He knows what his destiny is. He knows what they're going to do to him. I mean, we have to stop for a moment and think about that. I mean, how hard would that be to know I'm going into this city I'm going to lay down my life willingly. I, I'm God. I'm going to lay down my life willingly as a ransom to save humanity and go through that torture and that punishment, that death. I, I don't, it's hard for me to even grasp. He knew that this was his destiny. His face was set to it. He was obedient even unto death. The Bible Project, which is an amazing organization that y you can get their app and they have all kinds of re free resources, but they're fond of saying that the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. And it exactly does. And we are here now. This is the moment. This is the climactic moment when Jesus is going to enter into Jerusalem. Now, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was located on a mountain. In fact, this is the very same mountain in the land of Moriah where approximately 2,000 years earlier, Genesis 22 tells us that God told Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, to go to sacrifice his son, Isaac. It is this mountain where God stopped Abraham from sacrificing his son and instead provided a ram who was caught in a thicket, a bush, if you will, for Abraham to sacrifice on the fire instead of his son Isaac. This very act, 2,000 years earlier, was a foretelling of what was now happening. Because now, 2,000 years later, the Lamb of God is coming to Jerusalem, the city and the temple built on the same mountain, to be sacrificed for the sins of us all. Verse 29. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, when on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you why you are untying it, you shall say, the Lord has need of it. Now, to understand the context, I want us to take a look at this map. This is, a, this is sort of a, a map looking down on the city of Jerusalem at that time. And I want to get us oriented 
So Jesus, as I said a moment ago, was coming from Jericho up a very famous road, the Jericho Road, okay, to Jerusalem. It was a climb from below sea, sea level up over 2,000 feet to Jerusalem. He's approaching from the east. So think of Jericho as being way over here. And as he's approaching, Jesus is going to go through a small village called Bethany. Now, Bethany was the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And it's a place where Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, which, believe, believe me, created all kinds of tumult in Jerusalem. Because it's not like every day somebody was raised from the dead. Okay? So this news was already spreading about Jesus Christ. So Jesus comes into Bethany, which is about two miles located this direction. And he's literally coming toward the city of Jerusalem. Now, as he gets to Jerusalem, you'll see this is called the Mount of Olives, and it's on the east side of the city. Here is the Temple Mount, where the temple is located, and it faces to the east. Notice that the Garden of Gethsemane is located right here, and that this little spring called the Gihon Spring is located there. That's important. Keep that in mind, because the Gihon Spring is a place where Solomon was anointed to be the king after David. So, Jesus comes this direction, and it's likely that he's in Bethany at the time when he tells his disciples to go and find a colt. And this colt is going to be located probably in the village of Bethphage. They come to the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives then descends down its western slope into this valley. This is called the Kidron Valley. Say that to your neighbor. Kidron Valley. And you'll notice... That on this side of Jerusalem, there is the Hinnom Valley. Those are two very famous valleys that are mentioned in the scriptures. So, as Jesus <coughs> and his disciples approach, um, they, they literally are telling these two disciples to go forward into, he's telling them to go forward into a village, probably Bethphage, to pick up this colt to bring it back to him. Now, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but but as far as we know, Jesus walked everywhere that he went on land. And this is the first time in scriptures that we're going to see Jesus riding on something. Is right here. And he's riding on what, what is translated as a colt. But this word for colt is, this, is the Greek word that was used to translate the Hebrew word for donkey. So it, essentially, this is a young donkey that Jesus is going to be riding into Jerusalem. Another thing to note is that Luke tells us that no one had ever sat on this young donkey that Jesus was about to borrow and ride. A first time ride. Okay? And it ne had never been ridden prior to Jesus riding on it, which made it worthy for a very sacred and kingly purpose. Literally, for the Son of God to ride on it. Now, this principle was bookended later in this same story because after Jesus' crucifixion, he's buried in a borrowed tomb in which no one else had ever been buried. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a young donkey. He borrows it. It's never been ridden. After his crucifixion, he's buried in a borrowed tomb in which no one had ever been buried. Keep your eyes open for the patterns in the scriptures. So those who were sent away and <coughs> who those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, "Why are you untying the colt?" And they said, "The Lord has need of it." So the two disciples go into Bethphage, likely Bethphage, and they find things just as Jesus had predicted. And, and I want you to see that this is another example, a clear example, of Jesus' prophetic foreknowledge. He knows already what's going to be happening, and he tells his disciples to go into the town, and they find this colt just as he had said. And when the owners of the colt question why they were untying it, they tell him exactly what Jesus said. The Lord has need of it. Now, apparently, the owners of the donkey knew who Jesus was because they permitted the two disciples to take the donkey. <clears throat> and by telling his disciples to use the name Lord, Jesus was communicating something very significant. 
The word Lord in the New Testament is, is the Greek word kurios. Look at your neighbor and say kurios. Kurios. And that word is used to translate the Hebrew term Yahweh. So when, so when Jesus is telling them the Lord has need of it, he's essentially saying God needs to borrow your donkey, right? I mean, think about it. If, if somebody comes to your door and says God needs to borrow your lawnmower, you're probably wondering what institution they escaped from, right? Or, you know, it just doesn't happen every day at my house, right? But, but these, these men apparently knew Jesus and when they said the Lord has need of it, it's like, no problem, right? So they get the colt, and they bring it back to Jesus. Now, I want you to stop for a moment right here, okay? Because I don't know about you, but does riding a young donkey sound like the way for a king to enter into his main city? I mean, that's not what I would envision as the way for somebody really important to come into town, right? I mean, can you imagine Joe Biden or Donald Trump leading a victory parade through Washington, D.C., riding on a young donkey? I don't... Okay, I'm not going to stay there very long. I... Maybe some of you think they should be riding on a young donkey. I, I, I don't, you know, I just couldn't see that. I was having a hard time, right, picturing that in my brain, okay? And, and seriously, though, e even in Jesus' day, if... if this was certainly not the way that, that kings or generals would typically ride into their main city, right? The, the Roman generals or the emperors who would ride into Rome would typically ride in on the back of a white horse, leading a parade of captured leaders and prisoners, and towing behind them the spoils of victory from whatever war they had just engaged in. The leaders bowing down as to this, this great leader in front of them who is, who's riding this white horse. So it sort of begs the question, why is Jesus riding a young donkey into Jerusalem? Well, it's because Jesus is fulfilling Old Testament scripture. You like my donkey up there? He's looking at you, right? In Zechariah, chapter 9 Zechariah prophesied 500 years before the birth of Christ he wrote this rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion shout aloud O daughter of Jerusalem behold your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt the foal of a donkey. Now, Zechariah literally is writing this 500 years before it happens, and it's happening right here, right now in Jerusalem. 500 years before that, between 900 and 1000 BC, King David chose his son Solomon to be anointed as the new king over Israel and Judah. And he directs Nathan the prophet and others to set Solomon on David's ass, which is, which is another name for his mule or his donkey, to ride to the place where he would be anointed as king. The place where he was to be anointed as king was the Gihon Spring that I pointed to earlier. It was located on the eastern slope of the city of Jerusalem. The king was actually anointed with holy oil. So to ride on David's mule or donkey was a, a public proclamation to the Jews that Solomon's succession to the throne was approved by King David. Now fast forward a thousand years from that story through Zechariah's prophecy to this moment with Jesus Christ. Here's Jesus riding on this young donkey. And he was not only fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, but he was also publicly proclaiming at the same time his role as king in the line of David. But not just any king. He was the anointed one, the Messiah who was to come and restore the kingdom to Israel. The Hebrew word for Messiah is Mashiach. Mashiach, actually it's Mashiach. 
Look at your neighbor and say, Mashiach. It literally means anointed one. The Greek term for that is Christos. Christos. We call it Christ. A lot of times when I was, when I was young and just reading the Bible, I was reading Jesus Christ. I, I thought Christ was his last name. Well, that's a pretty cool last name, right? It's not his last name. It's actually a title. It means the anointed one. So, so Jesus, Jesus literally was the anointed one. There had been kings pre previously, but the prophecy of Zechariah was looking forward when the Messiah would come and restore the nation of Israel to its relationship with God that God had long promised. Relying on Old Testament prophecies, though, for centuries, the Jews had been looking for the promised Messiah, the anointed one, who would come to Israel, not to establish a spiritual kingdom, but to conquer its oppressors and restore the kingdom. So by riding this young donkey into Jerusalem and fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah, Jesus is announcing that the king, the Messiah, the anointed one, is coming to Jerusalem with righteousness and salvation. Verse 35, and they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. Nicole was talking about this earlier. When the donkey was brought to Jesus, some of the disciples took their outer garments off and they literally laid it on the back of the donkey so that it, it, essentially it would be like a saddle on which Jesus could ride. And, and then others spread their outer garments on the road in front of him as a sign of honor and act of royal homage because they recognized who Jesus was. When Jesus and his disciples get to the top of the Mount of Olives and they see Jerusalem before them, this is a depiction of what they saw. Now notice we have the Temple Mount is located here. The temple is here facing to the east. This is the Kidron Valley. That is the Garden of Gethsemane. The path that led down from the Mount of Olives would come down this way, across and to the back. So when Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives, he can see off to his left, probably, the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's going to be in a few days praying. This is Herod's palace located over here. This is the Pool of Siloam and the reservoir that held the water. So this is what Jesus beheld. And to give you some perspective, this was a world-class city in this time. I mean, there were, there were other large cities, but Jerusalem stood right there with them. It was a beautiful, beautiful city. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So as Jesus and his disciples start down the western slope of of the Mount of Olives to the Kidron Valley and toward the city walls, Luke tells us that Jesus' disciples began to praise God in a loud voice for all of the mighty works that they had seen. You see, they're thinking of the countless healings that they had observed, the casting out of demons, the raising of the dead, such as the, such as the, the raising of Lazarus, and Jesus walking on the water, and changing the water to wine, and multiplying the fish and the bread, and feeding thousands. I could go on, but they have seen and beheld all of these things with their own eyes. And, and they understand. They've never seen anything like this. They believe that Jesus is the king he is the messiah and the emphasis here is on what they have seen and so they begin to cry out with a variation of an old testament verse from psalm 118 26 psalm 118 26 actually says blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord 
But Jesus' disciples who are following him begin to cry out, Blessed is the king, the king, the anointed one, the Messiah. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And when the Lord comes or someone comes in his name, he comes either to rescue or he comes for judgment. He comes either for rescue or he comes for judgment. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Based on what they had seen, Jesus' disciples were convinced that he was the Messiah king of Israel who was coming to Jerusalem in the name of God. They also shouted peace in heaven and glory in the highest, which which also bookends very similar words that were used at the time when Jesus was born. Again, see the patterns. The angels in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, say, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. In other words, they are saying that Jesus as Messiah King comes to bring divine peace and glory from heaven. And given that he comes in the name of the Lord, to reject Jesus is to reject God. Now, I want you to understand the kind of peace that they were saying Jesus was bringing is, is not just the absence of conflict. I, I, I think we have a hard time understanding what peace is today, right? I mean, the world seems clearly not to know what peace is. Everybody is fighting one another. And certainly the absence of conflict is a level of peace. But the word for peace that's used here and that the disciples would have been screaming out is the word shalom. Say that with me. Shalom. Shalom is more than just the absence of conflict. Shalom is, is a positive blessing that comes from being in right relationship with God. It is. It comes from a rooted knowledge that it is well with my soul. I am in right relationship with God. It is a peace, now get this, it is a peace that is beyond the circumstances. It is a peace that exists even if there is conflict all around. That's the kind of peace that Jesus was coming to bring. A heavenly peace, a heavenly shalom that was rooted in right relationship with God, that Jesus is coming to restore, not just for the nation of Israel, but for the entire world through what he was about to do with his death on the cross to bring shalom to the world. The glory of God, the glory of God was coming into their midst. Now, I, I, I want to share one other detail with you, which I find really, really interesting. These, these disciples are, are coming to Jerusalem with thousands of other people at this time. You see, they're all coming as pilgrims to Jerusalem at this very time to celebrate the Passover, which was an annual feast of the Jews. And after the Passover, which would happen this week on Thursday, they also would celebrate a, for a full week what is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we've got lots of people, right, walking along these roads. And Jesus has got his own troop with him. Like, not just his 12 disciples, but maybe as many as 100 or more people. Plus those who have gathered just to see what's going on. I mean, have you ever seen people do that? They just, what's going on? We've got to get over there and check that out. And so there's, there's all kinds of people there. But Jesus' disciples are from northern Israel. And they spoke a language called Aramaic. Say Aramaic. Now, Aramaic is kind of a cousin of Hebrew, right? Same letters, but pronounced slightly differently. And it just so happens, from what we understand, that the people who lived in northern Israel, which sort of had this kind of blue-collar reputation, you know, the real powerful people were down south in, in Jerusalem and that in environs, but the fishermen and all them people were up in Capernaum and up north, right? So they spoke Aramaic, but they had a different dialect. It didn't sound the same as the refined people who lived in Jerusalem, okay? So, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but 
dialects, I, I, I like it when people speak differently. I mean, I was asking Emily this morning, like, Emily, where are you from? And, and she says, I'm from Mississippi. And I'm like, I just love her accent. Can we give Emily a hand? She's awesome, right? When I listen to her speak, it's like, it's like sweet tea on a swing, on a front porch, on a hot human day. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's, that's kind of how it hits me. I'm like, can you give me that again? Because it just makes me feel warmer to listen to you talk, okay? That sort of thing, right? But there are times when, like, dialects can, like, grate on people's nerves. It's kind of like, you know, if you're from New York and 100 people from Mississippi show up, right? They're like, so what, what, are, you, what are you doing here? You, you don't belong here. You know, what, what, what is, go back to where you belong, you know? You know, hey, Guido, come here, come here, come here. You know, I mean, so, so you know, sometimes accents can grate on people's service. I remember one time a client asked me to fly to Oklahoma to try a jury trial, right? And it was, it was in southern Oklahoma, right next to an Indian reservation. And it all had to do with this robotic arm that wasn't working right. And, but it was a lot of money, and so they wanted me to fly out and try this jury trial. So I do. I fly out, and I'm doing this jury trial, and, 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 you know, for several days. And the night before the closing argument, I go to dinner with my local counsel who's there to keep my rear end out of trouble and, and his wife. And, and we're there eating dinner together. And about halfway through this fine dinner, she looks over at me and she says, you know, I was wondering if tomorrow my husband could do the closing argument. And I'm thinking, why in the world would your husband do the closing argument because I've done almost the entire case. I mean, I've put on every witness. I've cross-examined. Those people surely love me by now, right? And she's like, I said, why, why, why should I do that? She said, well, she starts doing this. She says, well, you know, it's, it's, it's your accent. It just, it grates on people's nerves. I'm like, I can't say that. Are you kidding me? You're the one with the accent. What do you, right? Right? So, guess what I do? No, I go in and I do the closing argument and we win. So take that. All right? Well, I, I, I guess I'm going through this story because I want you to see it and hear it, right? Jesus' disciples are out there yelling, you know, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, and they're using a, a Mississippi accent in the northern territory. All right? And so if the Jewish leaders, who had the more refined form of speech, you know, heard this, they're, gonna, they're already going to sort of discount what these rabble-rousers, you know, who a bunch of blue-collar fishermen who probably still smell and don't even speak right are coming in and saying, I'm sure you've never done that. You've never heard an accent and think, uh, right? yeah, okay, it's all right. <clears throat> Moving on. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, <clears throat> if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now, I, I just got to tell you something. When, when Jesus has to use geology to correct your theology, you got a problem. Right? I mean, <laughs> that's kind of what he's saying here. It's like, listen, if you don't get it, I mean, if you don't understand that the king, would you look over there and see that temple that you have built to God? I am that guy. You built that to have a portal in relationship with me, and you don't even get it. And, and if you can't join with these funky blue-collar people with that funky accent and, and praise me, that's okay. But guess what? The very stones would cry out because I built the stone. I gave you breath. I created everything around you. It's hardwired. It's hardwired. And with this reference, 
the Pharisees to the Pharisees right here. This is the last time they make their appearance in the Gospel of Luke. And with very few exceptions, most of them have seen nothing of God in the works of Jesus. And because they understood the messianic cries of his disciples, they understood that Psalm 118 was a royal psalm. Psalm 118 was only typically supposed to be read and recited when a king was being coronated. When a king was being crowned, they understand that his disciples, in crying out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, are claiming that Jesus is king, and they will have none of that. They knew that. They understood the messianic overtones, and so they demand that Jesus rebuke his disciples for their blasphemy. They don't see Jesus as the Messiah king. But Jesus says, listen, <laughs> If, if you don't let them speak, the very stones would cry out. The point is that silencing Jesus' disciples or even silencing Jesus will not change the fact that Jesus is the king. Nor will it derail God's purposes. I got to tell you, that gives me a whole lot of joy. It gives me a whole lot of joy to know that no matter what the world does... No matter what the world thinks, no matter what the world says, Jesus is still the king. I don't know about you, but that gives me strength. That gives me some pep in my... You know, some of you maybe have never had a hard day. You've never had tough experiences. But, you know, seriously, though, I know that there are people in this room right now who are experiencing tough circumstances in their life, and you're having a hard time seeing God anywhere. You've got pains, hurts that still echo in your minds at 1 o'clock in the morning that happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. You've got all kinds of, of trouble at work or around you. The world seems to be falling apart. All of these things. And friends, let me tell you something. When that happens, I go back to this place. Jesus is still in control. Jesus is the king. God's purposes are going to be done no matter what happens around us. He calls us to shalom, to a different kind of peace. Verse 41, and when he drew near the city, drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. As Jesus approached the city, Luke tells us that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. I want you to understand the significance of this word. There's, there's a lot of Greek words that could be translated weeping or crying. But the particular word that Luke uses here is one of the strongest terms. It literally means a heaving of the bosom. The, in other words, Jesus just doesn't have a tear running down his face. He is seriously engaged in what I would call some ugly crying. He is pouring out a despair, a, 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 a sadness, a depth as he approaches the city walls. One scholar translated it, the, the word wept as Jesus was bursting into tears. In other words, Jesus is, 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 is experiencing just the sadness of, 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 of God himself over the fact that he's coming into the city where his own temple is built and his people don't even recognize him. These are not tears of joy. These are tears of sadness. Luke says that it was hidden from them. It was hidden from them. And it, it was not hidden from them by God, but as Nicole and even Lydia were saying earlier, it was hidden from them because of the state of their own hearts by the blinders or filters that they wore. Jesus did not fit their box. I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you just didn't see something? Maybe you've even hurt someone and you didn't realize you were hurting them. You just don't see it. And yet years later, hindsight, right? You can look back and you can say, man, I wish I hadn't said that. Or man, I wish I hadn't 
wish I had done it. I wish I could replay that. They don't see it, but they don't see it because of the condition of their own hearts. Jesus says this, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus is weeping because he knows that in approximately 40 years from now, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. He is essentially pronouncing prophetic judgment, the judgment that would come upon Jerusalem because Jerusalem rejected God. They did not know the time of their visitation. In the Old Testament, the phrase, the time or season of your visitation, refers to the coming of God, either for rescue or for judgment. The visitation of Jesus in Jerusalem was the presence of God coming to Jerusalem as Lord. Jesus has come for their good. He's come proclaiming salvation. He's come offering heavenly peace, peace with God. But if they reject him, his coming becomes the basis for their judgment because rejection of Jesus is rejection of God. The Jews ultimately revolted against the Romans. So in A.D. 66, the Romans laid siege to the city of Jerusalem, and it lasted for four years. Ultimately, the Romans built an embankment against the city, and they cut it off from any outside resources or reinforcements. And they went inside eventually in 70 A.D. after four years, and they killed everyone inside Jerusalem, except for some of the young men who were taken back to Rome to be killed in gladiatorial contests. Emperor Titus was appalled at the news of a story of a mother who had cannibalized her own child because they had no food. The city was cut off from all resources. This happened during the siege of Jerusalem. And Emperor Titus declared himself innocent of that abomination because he had offered the Jews peace and amnesty, but they were unreasonable and preferred rebellion and war. This is a depiction of the Temple Mount. And you can see the temple in the middle, right here, facing to the east. This little fence all the way around here was a fence beyond which Gentiles were not allowed to go. This was the court of the women where Jewish women could go, and this was where Jewish men could go, and only priests, Levites, into the temple itself. But when Rome came into Jerusalem in 70 AD, they tore down the entire temple structure, all of it. And all that was left was about 187 feet from Wilson's Arch to Robinson's Arch, down along this wall right here. Today, only seven rows of stone are left visible from the ground. And that is called the Wailing Wall. And it is where for the last 700 years, Jewish people have gone to pray because they did not know the time of their visitation. For me, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem is, is a tumult, it's a mix. Celebrating the coming of the Lord Jesus into Jerusalem, but yet at the same time remembering that he comes and it brings with it also judgment. We, we love to preach the love of God. I love to preach the love of God. <laughs> but we rarely want to talk about the judgment of God. And, and if we only say that God loves us, which he does, he, he loves us so much that he's sending his son to die for us. Do you get that? But that, that is such a serious and significant cost that it has a consequence. 
He offers us relationship, true shalom. But if we don't accept that, then we receive the judgment of God. And sometimes that judgment comes in, even in this life as it did to Jerusalem. But certainly it will come at the end. Now, as, I, as we close today, I want to ask you to do something that, that, that Nicole and Lydia were talking about earlier. I want you to envision for yourself that Jesus rides in on a young donkey into Tip City today. He literally rides up to this church, and he comes inside here. I want you to close your eyes with me. I want you to see that. Jesus rides in. He gets off his donkey in front of the church, and he, he literally walks up the center aisle today because I tell you what, Jesus has ridden in here today. And here's what I want to ask you. Do you look at him? Do you see him? And when he looks back at you, does he cry? Does he weep because you're not in relationship with him? You might even be someone who's followed Jesus for, for many, many years and and, and you're in relationship with him, but his disciples were too, and they didn't fully get it. They didn't fully get it. They needed a fresh vision of who Jesus was. You might be here this morning, and, and you feel more like the Pharisees because you have no relationship with him. You don't see him at all. Maybe it's your, your, your sin. Maybe it's your difficulties. Maybe it's your pain. Maybe it's a shame that you can't get rid of but you can't even hardly bear to look at him. Or maybe you're just like the multitude. Your life is so busy, you don't have time to slow down and go see what that's all about. Friends, we're no different than the people were that day. And Jesus is riding in here today, and he's saying, I want to give you shalom. I want to be in relationship with you. I want to set you free. I want to have a relationship with you and make your heart, transform your heart to be the image bearer of God that I intended you to be. He offers that to you today. And there's no better time to do that than at the beginning of Holy Week so that as you face the rest of this week, you face it in relationship with God, seeing Jesus in a new light, knowing him in a fresh new way. I want everybody to stand. I want you to close your eyes. I want every head bowed. Now, and I just want to ask you a question. Friends, this is, this is a serious moment. It was so serious that God left behind his kingly robes and he came to earth took the form of a servant and was obedient even unto death for you. This is a serious moment. So I want to ask you this question this morning. Is there peace in your soul? Do you need Jesus today? Don't let him ride by today. Don't let him ride by today. Even blind Bartimaeus yelled out when he heard Jesus was passing, Jesus! Jesus! He wouldn't let him ride by. Even the woman who had the issue of blood wouldn't let him pass. She, she strained through the crowd to just touch his garment so that she could be healed. Don't let him pass today. need the shalom of Jesus in your life. I just, every head bowed and every head closed, I just want you to raise your hand. Just raise your hand right where you are. Just raise your hand. Thank you. I want to ask the prayer team to come forward now. And all of you who raised your hands today to say, I want, 
I want the shalom of Jesus in my life. I want you to come down and I want you to pray with one of the prayer team leaders down here in the front. If pastors could come as well and just be down front, I want you to be available to pray with people because Jesus has ridden in here today. He's ridden in here today. And he's offering you heavenly peace, the glory of God. Why don't you be seated? Let's just close our eyes, be in prayer. For those of you who raised your hand, feel free to come just for a moment. It just wants to sit in a moment before the Lord and then I'll dismiss everyone. Visualize this in your mind, will you, as you pray, as you think about the Lord, Him riding into Jerusalem. And where are you? Where are you? And I pray that you will have a fresh vision of Jesus this week. You will see Him in a new light. And I pray that God will remove all filters and clutter from your mind and your heart so that you can see Him and come into relationship with Him and understand who He made you to be. He is the hope of glory. He is the only person who can transform our hearts, who can set us free from our sins, from our addictions, from all that, that holds us back. He is the one. It's his blood that can break those chains. So spend some time with him this week and think about this. Father, we thank you for your glory. We thank you for your son. We thank you that Jesus came into Jerusalem and rode in here, here today. And we say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name.